Welcome everyone to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com and UnderstandingAutoimmune.com where you can find over 440 plus and growing episodes of our show all about offering help and hope for those with autoimmune disease. A lot of practical life experiences too. So even if you found us and you say, Sharon, I don't have autoimmune, stay tuned. We offer a lot of practical life experiences here too. And I've got my tea with me. I hope you've got something good. Mm. Yeah, that's really good tonight. That's great. I've got my tea here. Hope you have something to curl up with because I have a dear friend of mine. She joined me a while ago and I just am such a fan of her. So let me introduce Pi Venus Winslow. She's a published author, public speaker, and transformational life coach for those recovering from narcissistic upbringing. Well, she's going to define that for us. <laughs> and she's on a mission to empower others to reclaim their authentic selves and live intentionally free from codependency and narcissistic abuse. Pi, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's great to see you again. It's wonderful to see you, Sharon. Thank you for having me back. Now, I know in the last show, everyone, you can catch up with us. Go back to understandingautoimmune.com and just search for Pi and you'll find her previous show. But just quickly tell people, what is codependency and narcissistic abuse? I've often found some people after I get to know them and I'm thinking in my own head, wow, that was quite a childhood or quite a traumatic series of events. And yet the people don't, from the inside, I don't know why they don't recognize it as that. Yeah. Codependency and narcissistic abuse, in my mind, they're two sides of the same coin. And codependency was a term that was brought into the public awareness decades ago. And I think originally it had to do with alcoholism. And so there was the alcoholic in the family. And then there was the partner back in the old days with the big book. It was mostly men were the alcoholic and women were the codependent wife enabling the alcoholic. These days, I think you can apply codependency to people who have been in situations in their lives growing up in a family where there was dysfunctional relationships, where one parent or both had addiction issues, or they were narcissistic, meaning they were self-centered and entitled, because addicts are self-centered. They're all about their addiction. And a parent may also be neglectful. They may be emotionally abusive, psychologically abusive, physically abusive, sexually abusive. So any kind of abuse or neglect, toxicity, or dysfunction in a family system is going to have an impact on the family. And so for people who are trying to tiptoe around, literally like walking on eggshells around an addict or a narcissist, it's going to be the same dynamic. And so I'm fascinated with narcissistic abuse and codependency because of my history. And I had an alcoholic father. So there was that aspect, but I also had a narcissistic mother. When I started working on getting myself well and healthy, I really dove into understanding narcissistic abuse and have since seen how codependency is the flip side of that and how as a child, if you grow up in that environment, you end up taking on certain traits that complement and work with the dynamic of the narcissist. It's also very interesting that some of the coping strategies are very similar. So even a codependent person, even though in a sense, there are things about them that complement the narcissist work with that relationship, codependents can also have similar traits as narcissists do as well. They can also be self-centered and they could also, because of their fear of being wrong or incurring the wrath of the narcissist, they will, they can be just as manipulative as the narcissist can be. So it's very fascinating. Wow. I wouldn't have re defined codependency with some of those aspects. That's fascinating where in a way, it's it's being mirrored back to the family dynamics in, in a strange way. 
Now, when I think of codependency, I think of someone who is always looking on the outside to confirm things. And I guess maybe the outside directs their inner compass. Is that, it, help us define codependency better because like I said, I didn't expect that part of being able to reflect back some of the narcissistic tendencies with, without being narcissist. It can get very convoluted. <laughs> But I think, like yeah, and I think about this stuff all the time and I'm like, oh, wow, oh, wow, there's just layer upon layer. So I think of codependency as a person who is very hyper aware of what is going on with other people to the extent that they are neglecting themselves. Now, I want to put an asterisk there, Pi. Are they consciously aware sometimes i find people that i might define that way and i'm thinking that's like a an old script that's running silently in the background i'm not sure that they if you were to talk to them there would be a super conscious awareness of that's how they walk through the world i think a lot of times it is a program you're right it is a program that is running in the background and it's a program that is learned from a young age and so just like anything you learn and you get really good at you can multitask you're not even thinking about it right you're just doing it it's like driving your car and then you get somewhere and you're like i don't even know how i got here i don't even remember driving here but you're running on autopilot. So codependents have many characteristics. There's a lot of characteristics that can help somebody identify if they're codependent. Number one, what I was just saying, if you grew up in an alcoholic family or with abuse or neglect, you very likely have codependent coping strategies and or traits. But other ways to recognize it are things, it can be a self-diagnosed a condition like you can ask yourself do I often feel inadequate do I feel like an imposter do I live most of my life in fear of what other people think their judgments their rejection fear of conflict do I find it hard to trust other people do I not trust myself am I taken advantage of often am I afraid to speak up and say what's on my mind do I live in fear of there not being enough love, not being enough money. Do I feel unworthy of love? Do I find myself getting in relationships with other people who are unhealthy, narcissistic, addicted, um, people who are manipulative or cruel or have a lot of drama in their lives, maybe get in trouble with the law or is my life often in a situation of high stress or drama? Do I struggle with shame? Do I feel ashamed of who I am often? Do I think I'm unintelligent or unlovable or unworthy of existing? Do I have addictions that if you do, you may be codependent. That may be just a way of dealing or trying to cope with deeper pain. Because of suffering, we develop, and I say we because I'm including myself with that, I am codependent. And it's my, my whole recovery process is that awareness and first that acceptance of these are my patterns and how am I going to get through today making different choices, breaking out of those patterns. I could see bits and pieces where even in my own checklist, I was going check, <laughs> check, <laughs> check. <laughs> and yet... One of the things that I do want to talk to you about, because I know you're an expert in helping people in this, and that is breaking free from those patterns. And I know you don't have to have all of that great big long list to be codependent. Or, And I think the bigger part is the noticing and the awareness in ourselves and then saying, at least for me, when I realized that there was a strong codependency in my background, that moment where I say, yeah, no, uh, I'm going to try and work on making it more conscious and controlled choices instead of the reactions that happen on script or the running the pattern in the background where I'd react. I think that to me is a big pattern that we need to pay attention to is if we listen to some of those and maybe you found out that you had more checks than blanks <laughs> there <laughs> to 
consider at what point do I take control of me? I, I think that's critically important. I saw that, especially with my autoimmune diagnosis. I'm going to switch gears on you, Pi, because I know you work a lot with family dynamics, but with my autoimmune diagnosis, the first doctor, a couple of doctors I went to, I was extremely compliant and really gave my health over to them, which in a way that makes sense and all of that. And I'm not discounting doctors or discrediting doctors, but I was letting others make decisions and really powerful decisions about my wellness and my well-being. And it took some real courage because I think about parental authority and then white coat authority, similar in a way. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, It took some real courage to finally stand up and say, hey, I know me best. And yes or no, that is or isn't going to work for me. That takes a lot of courage. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely does. Whether you're codependent or not. But I think especially if you struggle with codependent tendencies, you're absolutely not aware that you have as many choices as you do. I think there's a very limited focus because codependency, when I say people who are codependent, they focus more on other people than themselves. So there's a high level of self-neglect going on and a high level of not recognizing that we can respond differently to situations. I know it was true for me through most of my life growing up in the family that I grew up in, trusting other people to know what's best because I didn't trust myself. So I was told on a habitual basis that that my thinking was incorrect, that what I was feeling was incorrect, and that that the authority figure, my mother, or my father, always knew best. So yeah, it does and can translate into adulthood with anybody in authority, police, doctors, bosses, lawyers, anybody who seems like they have authority, people who are codependent will look to them for the answers, not recognizing that the problem with codependency is not being connected to yourself. And if you're not connected to yourself, you're going to listen to other people instead of cultivating your own authentic self, your own anchored in your own person, your own sovereign being, your own organism, and taking action and taking lead leadership and charge of your own life and your own choices. I did the same thing. I remember I have a thyroid, Hashimoto's thyroid autoimmune disease, which I believe comes from not being able to speak up most of my life. So this whole speaking chakra throat area of mine shut down. And, and when I got triggered, I would feel my throat close up. And so when I first started experiencing my autoimmune disease, I went to the doctor and I, because I was a uh, hy hypothyroid, I was very depressed and finding it very difficult to get up in the morning and very, very sad. My whole body, my whole metabolism was slowed down because my thyroid wasn't working correctly. And my doctor put me on he thought I was depressed. He didn't run any tests or anything. He thought I was depressed and wanted to put me on and did give me psychotropic depression, like heavy duty medication. And, and of course, I'm very upset. I don't know what's wrong with me. I know there's something wrong, but I don't know what it is. And I have this, this program running in my head that there's something wrong with me, that I'm bad and I'm ashamed. And when I'm like, I go into the doctor, I'm like, help me. And he puts me on the, these heavy psychological <laughs> drugs. And I had a terrible reaction right away to them. But because the reaction that I had was so strong from just that one dose that I tried, I went back the next day and I was like... I'm not going to take this. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm going to find somebody who's going to actually figure out what's going on. I'm not going to take these pills because first of all, it made me feel like my skin was crawling and it had a terrible effect on me. 
he just taking that one dose. And there was a part of me that said, there's something else going on. Ask more questions, get more information. And I ended up doing my own research and going to another doctor and saying, I want you to test my thyroid. And sure enough, that's what it was. Bravo for listening to yourself. Oftentimes as children, even if we didn't have what we'll call extreme cases or cases that were very overt that anyone could notice as narcissistic abuse or codependency developing in a family, is listening to yourself instead of taking that. I can't imagine continuing to take a medication where I felt like my skin was crawling and all, all sorts of other really adverse reactions. And as I've said at the beginning, and I say it a lot on the show, is we know us best. And someone could say, there are times in my life where I think I've been depressed, but I don't think I'm so depressed that I need medication for it. Maybe I just need a friend and a cup of tea <laughs> a few times <laughs> over a period of time or something like that. So this idea of knowing and a bravo for being able to trust yourself on, okay, this doesn't feel right and then taking charge. I think sometimes people say, when we tell our survivor to thriver stories, you make it sound so easy. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's not that easy. No. The steps are relatively simple if you think about the steps, but oftentimes it takes a great deal of courage and moving past fear. The scary parts can stop you. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're right. It's simple, but it's not easy. And it does require courage. And to, to cultivate courage, we must experience fear and we must push ourselves through it anyway. And so for me and a lot of people who I talk to and work with, there comes a point where the, the pain of staying the same or continuing down a certain path becomes more unbearable than the fear of change. And when I was talking about some of the traits of codependency is living your life in fear, in fear of what might be true, what we might, what might be true about ourselves that we are afraid might be true about ourselves, but isn't, it's all smoke and mirrors. It's just a program. But when you're codependent and you don't know yourself because you're so hyper-focused on other people, you don't know, you don't know yourself well enough. You don't know what you like because you're conforming to what other people like because you want them to like you or you want to fit in or you want to be loved. You're not, oh, you're not aware of what's really going on in your internal world because you are very hyper-focused outward. So you're very empathetic and tuned into everybody else. But then when you're sitting down and you're all alone and you're with yourself, you're like, I don't even, I don't even know what's going on here. I don't know what's going on with my body. I don't know what's going on with my mind. I think for me, that moment, the pain that I was in, because I was experiencing the effects of the thyroid disease, like I was waking up every morning disappointed I hadn't died in my sleep, I recognized that's not good. <laughs> Most no. people don't think that way. And I was afraid of these thoughts that I kept having. And that prompted me to go into the doctor. But then the experience that I had with the medication that he gave me was even more frightening. And so that what was left was, is if I'm going to, if I'm going to solve these problems, I need to be an active participant in getting myself well, which means that I've got to, I've got to take, I've got to take action. I've got to do some things. I've got to start talking to other people. I've got to gather some information. I've got to sit with myself and figure out, okay, what are these things I'm experiencing? What am I feeling? What's going on with my body? And then having the courage to go and talk to a person, a doctor, as somebody, an authority figure and say, this is what I want. This is what I think. And this is what I want. And if your doctor, if you find a doctor that's willing to work with you, that's great. If you have a doctor who's going to tell you, you don't know what you're talking about, I would be very wary of that. Not that we're doctors and we have all of the answers, but 
don't let somebody tell you what you're experiencing is not happening. I think that's really important, not just for the medical community, but gaslighting happens in lots of places, including we're going back to the family dynamic as well is don't let tell anybody tell you what you're experiencing is not happening because their experiences are adding up the situation differently than your experiences are adding up the situation. Both of the situations may be true in some dynamic. I have siblings and I compare it this way that if you talk to my siblings, we grew up in completely different families. Oh yeah. And it's because of the way my personality that I was born with interprets things very different than my siblings interpret. They're same parents, but they're three entirely unique people who view the world three very unique ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's true. And I think being in touch with yourself, it, it, it is part of the process of healing from codependency and healing from autoimmune diseases. I think that the best thing that people can do anybody who's even listening to this right now, like the best thing that you could do for yourself is to pull away from other people and the world for a short period of time every day and really just be with yourself and check in with yourself. Notice the thoughts that you think on a regular basis. Notice a pain in your body. Notice how eating sugar affects you during the day. Notice how not getting enough sleep impacts you. Notice your stress levels. And when you start to get impatient, notice how triggers feel in your body. Things that, that get your heart racing or, or activate your, your survival response because Stress is linked to autoimmune disease. And I know that's why I have autoimmune disease because of the high level of stress that I experienced for so many years growing up in my family. And then sure enough, leaving home at 18, I just continued the pattern. I created it though. It was all me creating it after that in my relationships, in the way that I was showing up or not showing up in my life. And that just kept exacerbating those stress levels. And it wasn't until I really started diving into this work and changing my patterns that my autoimmune disease started to actually reverse itself. Absolutely. That's when I started to look past the actual physical manifestation that was the most obvious to me and everyone else, but go deeper within myself and look at past traumas. Doesn't have to always be childhood, could have happened recently, and it doesn't have to be from the outside or whatever. What I'm saying could be your own reaction to something, or it could be a car accident. I don't like when people categorize trauma, however you interpret it to me. And if you interpret it as trauma, then you're going to have a stress reaction to it is how yeah. I look at trauma. Yeah. One of the things I wanted to ask, though, I agree with this idea of every day taking some time to set with yourself and examine and reassess and go inside. Mm -hmm. However, if you've never done that before, and I've met some people recently that I was fascinated that sitting quietly, even in, in a quiet room, is distressing to them. What are some thoughts about if you're one of these people like, A, I've tried meditation, that doesn't work, or B, I'm not comfortable being alone in a quiet place. Do you have any tips for like maybe just putting your toe in the shallow end if <laughs> sitting quietly with yourself for a few minutes sounds like you're in the deep end? I think if you're not used to it, it's going to be uncomfortable. And so what I would like to offer people who may feel discomfort sitting with themselves is to breathe into that discomfort and to consider allowing the discomfort because life is uncomfortable. We're uncomfortable all of the time, all of the time. There's always something going on. Like my feet are cold right now. <laughs> <laughs> if I focus on that, I can really feel the discomfort of, yeah, my feet are cold right now. And I could also tune it out as well. But it's okay to be uncomfortable. 
the more we resist discomfort or hardships in life, the more distressing they are. And so there's a difference between pain and discomfort. Discomfort is just noticing, oh, I'm feeling some pressure or I'm feeling a sensation and it's okay. I think the goal for recovery, at least for me, being a codependent, being somebody who's experienced narcissistic abuse and who's really striving to live a healthy, happy, peaceful life is being my own best friend mm -hmm. and really cultivating compassion and kindness for myself. And if I'm uncomfortable sitting with myself, it just begs the question, why don't I like myself? Why am I not comfortable in my own company? Perhaps it's my thoughts, the things that I think about myself that disturbs me, in which case, what are those thoughts? And why am I being hard on myself? Why am I beating myself up? Oh, guess what? That's a program. That's a program from my past that's been running in the background. No wonder it's difficult for me to sit with myself because I'm listening to a record that is damaging my relationship with myself. Reminds me of when we had Sarah Payton on, who talks about unconscious contracts, which this is definitely in that realm of unconscious contracts that we create with ourselves. And you've mentioned that I wonder, and I love the term I wonder when we're talking to ourselves because it isn't beating ourselves up. It's just a coming with a curiosity of where did I pick this up? I wonder how this developed. I wonder, and I love that phrase that you started to talk about. It was like wonder about that in talking to yourself in a really kind and loving way without being critical when you uncover something that maybe it's a pattern and you can relate it clear back to your early days mm -hmm. and just being really curious about it instead of critical of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that is part of, that is part of opening up that space of self-awareness and meta-awareness is when we can be curious instead of critical and when we can expand the scope of what we're seeing, it's a bigger picture, right? It's like zooming out of the planet Earth. It's like when we can start seeing ourselves as like from a different perspective, we can see more of ourselves. We can see our life story. We could see our struggles. We can then detach a little from the internal stuff and have a little more compassion and kindness and care, but that can only come with practice. For somebody who struggles with this, again, I would say just taking some deep breaths and asking yourself, can I be willing? Can I be willing to be my friend today? Can I be willing to be gentle with myself today? Can I be willing to be kind with myself today? Even if it's just for a few moments, you can build on that, but it does come down to a willingness. I love those questions. We need to take a quick commercial break, so we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. You don't have to have an autoimmune to be here. And we love our community of about empowering help and hope for those with autoimmune plus other conditions. And tonight we're talking with Pi Venus Winslow, and she's a published author, public speaker, and a transformational life coach. And her mission is to help people uncover their authentic selves, as you've heard, and live free from codependency and narcissistic abuse. Pi, you've been offering some fantastic situations and examples and understandings of how we can move past the fear, get comfortable with the fear, and then move forward and courageously embrace who we really are. However, it's not a, completely analogous, but in my example that perhaps we can talk about is I found out I couldn't eat gluten. I had many family members at holidays, birthday parties, whatever it was, like, oh, just have a bite. So in a way, I'm wondering, as we begin to come more fully expressed to who we really are and move past these old patterns, 
what are some tips you have when maybe those people are still in your world and you want them there at whatever degree that you want them there? How do we continue to stay strong with outside forces wanting us to go back to the way we were because we're upsetting the apple cart? That's a good question. And I know a lot of people struggle with that. And I struggle with it too, sometimes to this day. And I think what it really has to do is that specific example. The first thing that came up to me was having strong boundaries with other people is only possible when we have strong boundaries with ourselves. And so I think the way to keep ourselves on track is, like I said, it's a daily awareness. It's a decision every day. Like for me, when I wake up in the morning, my decision every day is how I want to experience my day, making a conscious decision. Like today, I'm going to make sure that everything I eat is going to be nutritious. Today, I'm going to make sure I move my body and I exercise. Today, I'm going to make sure that I'm aware of my stress levels. And if I'm feeling stressed, that I take a few moments to check in and see what it is that I really need, what my body needs, what's going to be good for me, what's going to support me. And that goes into the support and the self-care. When it comes to other people, nobody can really force us to do anything. We either buy into whatever they're trying to sell us it's not going to hurt you when we may actually know better. Actually, I don't want to feel the discomfort that will come. Maybe it won't hurt me, but I will feel some discomfort. Something's going to happen. There will be a consequence. We get to set boundaries with ourselves and and make that decision within ourselves first. Am I going to, am I going to eat this food that's going to have this consequence? Am I going to choose this? is this what I want? And if the answer is no, then you can just share that with somebody else. You can just say, I really don't want it. I really don't want that. Thank you, but no thanks. And why they want you to eat it, why they're so attached to you eating it, that's interesting. (laughs) Again, you can be curious. You can be like, you can even ask, you seem very adamant that I eat this. Why is that so important to you? And put it back on them. (laughs) It's a funny way you mentioned that because I have family members who I grew up in a family of have a cookie, you'll feel better. Ah. There's a real emotional attachment to food in one section of the family I grew up in. There's a real emotional attachment to the coming together with food and the social events that happen around food. I think that's the thing. Like I can't really be celebrating a friend's birthday or a family member's birthday if I'm not really eating the cake. (laughs) And I'm like, yeah, you can. (laughs) It's not about the cake. (laughs) No, it's not about the cake. The cake's a part of the ritual, but you don't have to have the cake for you to actually genuinely wish somebody a happy birthday. It is questioning belief systems. It's questioning patterns. It's questioning behavior. It's questioning ourselves. It's or in questioning other people. Like, why? Why is it so important to this person that I eat cake? If maybe they'll feel better if they have what they're wanting me to have. I don't know. But that's the thing too, is we also get to recognize, especially if we're codependent, that It's not our job to make people feel better. I want you to say that again, because I think that's one of the critical, important things, including it's not my job to make my doctor feel better that I'm being compliant or non-compliant when I say I tried that drug and it made me feel a thousand times worse. That's the critical thing. It's not our job. (laughs) It's not our job to make other people feel better. So we don't have control over the inner workings of other people. We don't make people feel anything at all. They generate their own experience through their own filters, their own lenses, their own thinking. And so, like you said, completely different experience growing up. 
in your family. It in this happens everywhere in life. Somebody can have witness a, an event that happens and if the detective goes around and asks people about what they've experienced, people are going to say different things because they experienced it in a different way. So when we can let go of carrying the burden of being responsible for other people's thoughts, feelings, behavior, and we recognize the only thing we really need to worry about is our own thoughts and our own feelings and what we choose to do. Oh my gosh, what a tremendous relief. Setting boundaries and taking a stand for yourself is being okay with somebody's reaction to it. That it's not about you. It's about their own internal stories and internal dialogue and that if I'm doing it from a place of health and being for myself and I'm not harming anyone in that decision, then I think that's the end of the story where a lot of people sometimes will lash back as if trying to get you to go back to your old self, <laughs> become compliant and do the old stuff. Yes. And there's a reason that happens. It's because when we start changing the way that we interact with other people or the outside world it changes the dynamics. So other people are forced to respond or react to us in a different way because the normal thing is not working anymore. People don't like change. It's uncomfortable. We, we all want to be comfortable. We all want things to be easy. We all want what we want when we want it. We want it now. And that's what we want. And yes, that makes sense. And that's not reality. It's not reality. And when we show up different and somebody else can't respond to us in the same way and they've got to change, there's a level of discomfort, often agitation that comes with that. And of course, they want us to go back to being the way they were because then they can go back to the way they were because that's the pattern and that's easy. Changing patterns is not easy. That's why it's uncomfortable. And that's why I say, if you want to, if you want things to be different, accept that there is going to be some level of discomfort. The good news is that the discomfort will not last if you are consistent with the new change. That will become the new pattern. The odd thing I found about that is every time I make that change and there's discomfort and sometimes there's big discomfort. Once I get used to that and it has become a pattern of, okay, even a few years ago, what I would have considered big discomfort is now less discomfortable because I've had so many experiences of going through discomfort. It's not as uncomfortable as it was. That's an amazing awareness too. It's we're, we're so much stronger and capable and resilient than we believe we are. If you have struggled in your life and you are still alive, you are resilient and you are strong and you are sturdy and you can tolerate some discomfort much more than you think you can. So I had a coach who told me to get comfortable with being uncomfortable because that means you're living. I love that too. I've heard that before. And I had a coach tell me one time, you're building the plane while you're flying it. So just get used to it. Exactly. <laughs> this idea. Yeah. I love that metaphor. It was just like, okay, it's you don't have all the answers yet. You don't know what's going on, but you're running down the track, whether you really know where the end game or the final ribbon is going to be. Talking about final ribbons, we're down to the last five minutes, Pi. I want you to share some final thoughts and tips and then also how people can learn more about your amazing work helping others conquer codependency and overcome narcissistic abuse. Okay. I think what I'd like to leave people with is, well, hopefully some curiosity about, about the recovery process. And I use recovery as a wide it's a wide net that I throw out because you can recover from anything in your life that is not working, whether it is a physical, a medical condition, a thinking patterns, anything in your life, we have the power to shift or change in some way. 
we might not be able to erase it or cure it completely, but we can improve our lives. And it's a continual process. And if we're willing to be in that process, if we're willing to get support from the right kind of support from the right people who genuinely don't have an alternate agenda going on, who generally want to see us improve and be well and be happy and are going to support us through that process, then we absolutely can recover and get better. For people who are interested in the work that I do, you can check out my website. My company is called Full Venus Rising, and you can find me online or you could Google my name or Google my company, Full Venus Rising, and you can get a free copy of my book, which is available on my website. My book is called Mother Medusa Weaving Myth, Ritual, and Magic into Healing from a Narcissistic Upbringing. It's a little short story about myself, about growing up with a narcissistic mother, the effects that it had on me, and how I learned to recover and reclaim myself and my life and completely change everything that was happening in my life. But that's a conscious decision. And so it's a process as well. It's not something that happens overnight, but the first step is to make a decision that There are some things going on in my life that I want to change that aren't really working for me anymore. And when you can identify that and identify the patterns, I always say, once you see the pattern, you have the power because now you have an awareness that you didn't have before. And when you can find ways to interrupt those patterns and change, little course changes can completely over the long haul change your trajectory, completely change the direction that you're going. I love that. And here again, the flying metaphor comes to my mind because as a pilot myself, I remember in flight school, they said how important it was to chart your course and be very exacting with it because even a 1% change at the beginning takes you to a completely different destination. (laughs) So I remember that visual from those trainings in flight school. That's so amazing when you said that. I had this flashback, obviously, talking about the building the plane while we're flying it. And now my brain is in flight mode here. Anyway, thank you so much, Pi. It's always wonderful to see you and sharing all your wisdom and everything. I do believe that through my experience in healing from autoimmune and all the people I've interviewed, that there is some little thread behind this of whether you may say I'm not codependent 100% or narcissistic, a parent 100%, whatever. But I have found that in all the interviews I've done, that people say when I recovered from a lot of my beliefs that were no longer working, the old patterns that were no longer working, and uncovered the, some of the things that I was taught and I integrated into my being were no longer working. It was amazing how my physical health began to recover too. So I really encourage you to uh, get over to uh, fullvenusrising.com, find out more about Pi's work as well as her awesome book. And everyone have a great week, whatever your adventures. And if you're on YouTube, please subscribe. We're trying to build our subscribership here on YouTube. Click the, if you liked it, that'll help more people be able to see us and have a great week. As I said, join me next week for another new adventure. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes.